Hello folks. We're going to talk a little bit about life's origins in some detail in this presentation. We'll see that there are two basic ideas that suggest that life begins either with heterotrophs or autotrophs. Accepting that evolution is in fact one of the properties of life and that there was a time on earth that was devoid of life, then evolution only begins with the first cells. Before the formation of the first cells and therefore the origin of life, Biochemical and metabolic reactions must have been forming along with the structures that would eventually coalesce into the first cells. That period of physical chemical experimentation has been called chemical evolution or metabolic evolution to distinguish it from the evolution of living things. Ideas about life arising from non-living matter, that's abiogenesis, go back a long ways. Of course, the Bible had a lot to say about how life began, and during the Middle Ages, in the Western world anyway, biblical writings dominated the discussion. A rebirth of humanism in the Renaissance led to new scientific curiosity, particularly about notions of spontaneous generation, the creation of flies from feces, for example. You may not know that Anton von Leeuwenhoek whose microscopes for the first time permitted high magnification examination, for example, of protozoa, did experiments that were among the earliest to challenge the notion of spontaneous generation. You are probably aware that Louis Pasteur finally demonstrated that even bacteria do not arise by spontaneous generation. Of course, Charles Darwin recognized that spontaneous generation does not occur, but he and even Aristotle, among ancient Greeks, understood that some kind of gradual abiogenesis must have occurred before there was life on Earth. So, in this presentation, we are interested in abiogenesis. This occurs when an entity, a cell, existed that possessed all of the properties of life listed in this slide. As a reminder, read through this list of properties on your own and what these properties accomplish for cells and organisms. Note that in the title of this presentation I said origins, that's plural, on the grounds that if prebiotic conditions could have supported the origin of the first cell, then why not spawn more than one first cell? So let's begin our exploration of how life began. Let's start by assuming that the Big Bang must have produced a cosmos and a solar system, including the Earth, that had the chemicals required to support life. Then we must ask how and when did events occur that got us from the basic chemistry set to those first cells. In other words, we have to propose where the free energy came from to infuse inorganic matter with life, along with rational pathways and timelines for the different events. Then we need to think about those events. For example, the formation of organic molecules, the origin of polymers, nucleic acids, enzymes, whose actions were the beginnings of copying or reiterating chemical reactions, the linkage of biochemical reactions in metabolic pathways, the origin of information storage and retrieval, the packaging of metabolism behind semi-permeable membranes. Finally, we must realize that many of these experiments in prebiotic biochemistries would have been concurrent rather than sequential. For example, semi-permeable membranes did not suddenly surround just the right mixture of biochemicals to make a cell. Rather, the biochemistries and metabolisms and the storage and retrieval of information must have been taking place within semi-permeable packages even before life in what might be called a protocell, so that the grand prebiotic experiment that led to life was pretty much a collaborative adventure from the get-go and any explanations we come up with must be consistent with phylogenies that place life into three domains. Here they are. Recall that archaea include many extremophiles like the heat-loving thermophilic bacteria. And recall that archaea and eukaryota are more closely related to each other than either is to the true bacteria. We can define the organism that gave rise to all organisms in this phylogeny, and thus all organisms alive today, as our last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, L-U-C-A. This is shown at the root of the phylogeny. The LUCA is sometimes also called the protonote, as we heard in an earlier presentation. But that term was originally meant to designate the very first true cell. LUCA would be a descendant of the protonote. 
And if abiogenesis occurred more than once, then maybe the concept of a progenote would be moot, or we would have to think of multiple progenotes. There are two major hypotheses for which chemicals were already present on Earth, or that formed when the planet formed about 4.8 billion years ago. The term prebiosis refers to chemical and physical conditions that enable the origins of life under one or another of these sets of conditions. One hypothesis shown here assumes a reducing atmosphere on the prebiotic Earth that led to an origin of heterotrophs and heterotrophic metabolisms first, from which all other cells and metabolisms then must have descended. The other hypothesis begins with a non-reducing Earth atmosphere and suggests that autotrophs came first, with autotrophic metabolism first powered by a natural proton gradient. We're going to look at both of these scenarios in a bit more detail here. Based on an analysis of the atmosphere of oxygenless and presumably lifeless planets in our solar system, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Alexander Operin and J.B.S. Haldane suggested that the early Earth's atmosphere would be, like those planets, rich in inorganic chemicals that with the help of an input of energy would have seeded the oceans with organic molecules. The principal chemical constituents on a prebiotic Earth, as proposed by Operin and Haldane, were mainly carbon dioxide, water, that is water vapor, hydrogen sulfide, as well as some methane, ammonia, and even perhaps some hydrogen gas. There would have been, of course, no free oxygen, but many oxides. The physical conditions predicted by Operin and Haldane were, to say the least, hellish. It was hot. Without oxygen, there could be no ozone layer to absorb ionizing radiation like X-rays and gamma rays, which could reach the Earth's surface in abundance. There would have been ionizing electrical storms, lots of volcanic activity, and, under the oceans as they were forming, thermal vent activity. These were abundant sources of free energy. In their famous experiment, shown here, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey fed gases like ammonia, hydrogen, methane into water vapor created by heating water in the ocean in the flask on the left. After the gases mix with the water vapor, they get an electrical shock, here it is, an electrical shock, or some other ionizing radiation. When the vapor then condenses, the water in the ocean flask can now be shown to contain organic molecules. The experiment demonstrated that the chemical and physical conditions of a prebiotic Earth, as predicted by Operin and Haldane, could in fact have produced a primordial soup of energy-rich molecules. The earliest data from Miller and Urey indicated the presence of several organic molecules, including a few familiar metabolic organic acids like lactate and acetate, and amino acids as well as several highly reactive compounds like aldehydes and nitriles. The latter would be expected to participate in spontaneous chemical reactions that formed organic compounds. Later experiments, including some based on results that Miller left behind when he died in 2010, reveal that purines, carbohydrates, fatty acids, and as many as 23 different amino acids could also be found in his artificial primordial soup. Ah, there's the urea, lactate, and acetate uh, in that list uh, that I neglected to show you. Let's remind ourselves of how monomers polymerize by dehydration synthesis, that is condensation reactions, to make polysaccharides, polypeptides, and nucleic acids. These water removal reactions characterize polymer formation. Here is a way that this could have happened on a prebiotic Earth. High heat could have fueled catalytic polymer formation in prebiotic tidal pools as animated here. Imagine tides go out, leaving a hot tidal pool in which organic molecules concentrate as the water evaporates. High heat, or heat of baking as it's sometimes called, on mineral-rich clays could have catalyzed polymerization reactions before there were enzymes or even protein. Finally, high tides come in and resupply the monomers. This scenario could have worked if the newly made polymers were in some way anchored to the sediments in which they formed. Otherwise, receding tides would constantly disperse and dilute the polymers in a wider ocean. Could the same cyclic tides have produced replicating polymers? Let's take a look. As monomers once again concentrate in an evaporating tidal pool, so would short polymers, for example, oligonucleotide RNAs. 
At some point, monomer nucleotides might find their complements on these short polymers. The combined heat of baking and clay-based catalysis we saw before would replicate a complementary nucleic acid strand. Imperfect replication could generate related families of polymers shown here. When the tides return, the monomers are replenished. Renewed evaporation, heat, and catalysis in the pool repeats the cycle, this time replicating and expanding the related families of nucleic acid strands. Again, this could only be efficient if the newly made polymers were in some way anchored to or trapped in their catalytic sediments. All in all, this scenario hung together nicely for many decades. But what if the Earth's environment was in fact a non-reducing one? Recent evidence points in that direction, raising questions of how organic molecules formed and casting doubt on the idea that the first cells on the planet were heterotrophs. More current proposals for prebiotic chemical experimentation in a non-reducing environment are based on alternative sources of free energy and organic molecules that would have preceded life. And these look quite different from those assumed by Operin, Haldane, and Miller. So what if the first cells were not heterotrophs? What if they were autotrophs, as suggested by this alternative scenario? Well, first of all, evidence that the prebiotic Earth might in fact not have been a reducing Earth, but a rather a non-reducing prebiotic Earth, comes from rocks like this piece of zircon that was dated to 4.4 billion years ago. That time period is during the Hadean Eon, beginning at the Earth's formation about 4.8 billion years ago. Definitive evidence of life goes back to 3.8 or maybe as far as 4.1 billion years ago, but geochemical analysis of these Australian zircon rocks suggests that their oxidation state is the same as that of rocks dating to much more recent times, well after life existed on Earth. This is the evidence that the early prebiotic Earth environment might have been non-reducing. So where then did the Earth get its organic molecules? Could they, or even complete living organisms, have come from outer space? The ideas may not be as crazy as they sound. As for panspermia defined here, scientists believe that life could indeed have formed elsewhere in the cosmos. Think of the funds spent looking for water on Mars and other planets, not to mention SETI, that's S-E-T-I, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Still, I wouldn't blame you for being incredulous. After all, you might ask, how could life have survived on a meteorite or an asteroid? On the other hand, such heavenly bodies could have brought organic molecules with them. For one thing, organic molecules may have been formed along with the Big Bang itself. They are part of the interstellar dust and are found on comets and the like, so anything is perhaps possible. But for now, let's look at more earthly origins, even on a non-reducing Earth. While tidal pool scenarios fit nicely with Operin and Haldane's primordial soup model, the origin of organic molecules and replicating polymers in a non-reducing environment must have been quite different. Without a reducing environment, how might organic molecules have formed if not in tidal pools? And how would they have polymerized? Inherent in these questions is an assumption that these organic molecules still formed in redox reactions on Earth and that their efficient polymerization is still possible on a non-reducing planet. Answers to these questions could be different localized environments that had high concentrations of inorganic molecules and a sufficient amount of free energy to convert them into organic molecules, and some kind of primordial catalysts, perhaps mineral clay surfaces. Remember that many of today's enzymes incorporate some of the same metals that were in those catalytic clays. Could metal ions, for example, magnesium, manganese, iron, etc., that now serve as enzyme cofactors, be a legacy of those clays? Could they have catalyzed organic molecule synthesis and polymerization? In a non-reducing Earth environment, there would have been no worldwide source of reducing power to make organic molecules out of inorganic ones. There may have been ionizing radiation, there may have been uh, electrical storms, but they would not have been used to make organic molecules out of inorganic ones. But what if life originated in deep sea hydrothermal vents? Those that exist today are rich in minerals, which could have been the basis of catalysis, 
as well as inorganic molecular precursors, and their high temperatures could have facilitated catalytic formation of organic molecules. Some of this has been demonstrated ex experimentally. But the temperatures of volcanic, that is to say black smoker vents, range as high as 350 degrees centigrade. These temperatures mitigate against any stable origin of life's chemistries. On the other hand, the more moderate temperatures of so-called alkaline vents or white smokers could have made them the prebiotic chemistry set that led to life. Let's consider that possibility. In the laboratory, at white smoker temperatures of 150 degrees centigrade, minerals in serpentinite, a piece of which is shown here, catalyzes the formation of organic molecules, methane, etc. So a precondition of prebiotic chemistry, the formation of organic molecules, is possible in these vents. But what's to prevent these gases from dispersing from the vents right into the oceans? Thinking about this problem led to a very clever proposal for metabolic evolution that provides a source of free energy within a semi-permeable space. The alkaline emissions from the vent would be rapidly neutralized in wider acidic oceans. Without a nutrient-rich organic soup, there would be no selective force for the origins of heterotrophic cellular metabolism, right? I mean, if you don't have an accumulation of organic molecules in a primordial soup, there is nothing for protocells and eventually cells to actually eat. There's no drive to produce heterotrophic cells. So what then were the thermodynamic conditions in an alkaline vent that could have led to cellular life, and what kinds of cells would have formed? The porous rock structure of today's alkaline vents provide microspaces or microcompartments that might actually have captured alkaline liquids emitted by white smokers, so they didn't just get thrown out into the wide ocean. Conditions in today's alkaline vent, replicated in a lab, can actually form hydrocarbon biofilms. Biofilm-lined microcompartments in this porous rock could have formed a primitive prebiotic semi-permeable membrane adhering to a rocky cell wall, if you like, within which alkaline waters might be trapped. Not all of it, in other words, goes out into the wide ocean. The result, interestingly, would be a natural proton gradient between the alkaline solutions of organic molecules trapped in these microcompartments and the surrounding ocean waters, which are in fact acidic. Did all this happen, providing a source of free energy that we know today as a major source of free energy for ATP synthesis? A clear implication of this scenario is that chemical experimentation after the formation of organic molecules, including polymer formation, could have taken place within these biofilm microcompartments using proton gradients as a source of free energy. All right, in a non-reducing Earth environment, life origins in a deep sea hydrothermal vent like we just talked about does not lead to a primordial soup. Without nutrient-rich waters, there's nothing to drive the selection of consumers or heterotrophic life, as I've just noticed a few moments ago. So, in a non-reducing Earth atmosphere, the heterotrophs first scenario is not an option. The only option left is an autotrophs first scenario for the origin of life. Nick Lane and his co-workers proposed that the proton gradients that we just talked about were in fact the selective force behind the evolution of early metabolic chemistries in alkaline vents. Prebiotic structures and chemistries organized around biofilm compartments could have harnessed the free energy of natural proton gradients. In other words, the first protocells, and then cells, would likely have been chemoautotrophs. In the autotrophs first scenario for life's origins, the origin of replicating polymers is not yet satisfactorily explained. The focus instead is on an early origin of energy metabolism. If a natural proton gradient is a storehouse of free energy, then the question is not how individual chemical reactions might have been selected, but how a set of energy capturing reactions were selected that then underpinned all subsequent metabolic evolution. The questions then are, when and how was the natural proton gradient free energy cap captured to power prebiotic chemical reactions? When did proton pumps take over from natural proton gradients in the alkaline vents? Was ATP the first high-energy intermediate to power prebiotic reactions? And if not, when did the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA, achieve this milestone? 
since all of its descendants pump protons across membranes to make a proton gradient. They also use the proton gradient free energy to make ATP. They use a membrane ATP synthase to do this, and then of course they use ATP to power virtually all of life's work. Okay, so we often say that one of the earliest biochemical pathways to evolve is glycolysis. But in a non-reducing earth origins scenario, there would have been no selective driver to evolve a fermentative pathway if there were no nutrients in a soup to ferment. Chemoautotrophs would harness free energy from proton gradient. When they evolved the capacity to pump protons across membranes, and this could have occurred even before life itself, electron transport redox reactions would have evolved in those membranes. Electron transport would source electrons from organic molecules, perhaps driving the selection of something like the Krebs cycle. Could that, in fact, be the oldest known biochemical pathway? Later, though perhaps not much later, oxygenic photoautotrophy might have evolved in local protected environments. I say protected because oxygen would be toxic to anaerobes then as it is today. Photosynthesis would have also co-opted membrane-bound electron transport and proton pumping reactions, this time to capture solar energy and electrons by splitting water. A molecular analysis suggests that while all cells can ferment glucose, glycolytic enzyme gene sequences of archibacteria and eukaryotes share considerable similarity, but neither are particularly similar to those of bacteria. And this is summarized by the phylogenetic tree shown here. This is a tree we've seen before. However, this tree emphasizes that heterotrophy could have evolved from an autotrophic LUCA independently in the lineage leading to true bacteria on the one hand, and in the lineage leading to eukaryotes and archibacteria on the other. In other words, the ability to capture free energy from carbohydrates may have evolved independently, that is to say more than once. So the glycolytic pathway we share with most bacteria may not be the oldest biochemical pathway after all. It might have been something more like the Krebs cycle that was more directly linked to the generation of a proton motive force. Such reactions in photosynthesis or respiration are perhaps more likely in a non-reducing scenario for the origin of life. Okay, so let's sum up here. Speculation about life's origins begins by trying to identify a source of free energy with which to make organic molecules. As we've seen, the first cells could have been heterotrophs formed in a reducing earth environment from which autotrophs later evolved. Alternatively, the earliest cells could be autotrophs formed under non-reducing conditions in the absence of a primordial soup. And only after these autotrophs had produced enough nutrient-free energy to sustain them did heterotrophs belatedly emerge. And that brings us to the end of this presentation.